Would you please find your Bibles and join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 7? If you would find verse 10 is where we will be this morning as we're preaching through the book of 1 Corinthians. Two issues in our day that seem to be treated rather flippantly, one being marriage, two being divorce. Marriage is in the process of being redefined by the culture. A man and a man can get married now, a woman and a woman get married, and uh, the dominoes will continue to fall. I believe in those areas, but uh, rather flippantly is marriage in our day. I would also tell you more planning goes into the actual wedding than who you're actually going to marry. Also in our day, it used to be that God's representatives were sought out to preside over the wedding. Nowadays, anybody can download a certificate and you can marry whoever you want. Courtrooms are filled with divorce papers awaiting a judge's signature, and it's just looked at in our day as that's just another option. They put down to reconcile the differences, but really what it is is unwilling to reconcile differences. Also, in our day, adultery is just another media tabloid, but nothing to be too shocked over anymore. I would just tell you as we look in our text today, as we open up God's word, I think we'll see in our text that God sees these two issues very differently than we do today. He does not treat marriage or divorce rather flippantly, as you'll see. And the topic at hand today is the title of the message. The title of our message today, Marriage and Divorce. If I could be used to save one marriage in this room today, I would count this sermon as a success. And that's what I'm preaching for today. If you'll find with me verse 10 of chapter 7, it says this, Now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. So Paul addresses his first audience, and the first audience here is to the married. That is who he's speaking to. And this, as he's uh, speaking to the married, the married couple here is, is married believers. This group he's talking to are two equally yoked people in the Lord, to the married. He's responding to this uh, group there at Corinth and at the church who were asking these questions. And so we can obviously take those things away. First, I'd like to point out, though, this is a command from the Lord. But Paul says, to the married I command, but not I, the Lord does. And so what Paul is referring to is the teaching of Jesus on this subject. He is referring back to what Jesus has said already on marriage and divorce. Uh, And the subject at hand is that a wife is not to depart from her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. Pretty simple, right? And the command there is obviously to stay married. If you're a married believer, stay, stay married. And what Paul is teaching, what he's saying is, not I command, but the Lord is, is that that's exactly what Jesus taught on marriage. And so what we're going to do, since he's quoting from Jesus and he's referring back to Jesus, we're going to look back at what Jesus has said on marriage. Now, I'll just tell you as we're going to go through this, it's going to get a little heavy as you see this. But I want you to just all be assured we can end up on a good place today. But I want you to see more than anything God's heart on marriage as we as we walk through this. Marriage, as Jesus says in Matthew, it was meant to be permanent since the time God created it. And you can find that in Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. He says this, Then he arose from there and came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan. And multitudes gathered to him again, and as he was accustomed, he taught them again. The Pharisees came and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife, testing him? And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to them, Because of the hardness of your hearts, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. 
So right here is uh, we see as what Paul has in his mind of what Jesus said on the divorce. Same thing Paul is teaching. It was meant to be permanent from the beginning. It was meant to be for a man and a woman alone. And it was never meant to be broken. We can see all those things. But now we're actually going to see Jesus' uh, teaching on divorce. And that's found in verse 10. As if we keep going here in Mark chapter 10. Verse 10 says, In the house his disciples also asked him again about the same matter. So he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. So I'd like to point out to you that the consequences of sin in this area begin to spread. And so if there's a man and a woman and one of them leaves and marries somebody else, even though a divorce may have taken place on earth, God still sees them as married. And so as soon as they marry someone else, they have committed adultery. Because God still sees that first couple, that first original union, as being one. And whoever they marry, they commit adultery. Because they've now slept with another man's husband or another woman's uh, wife or another man's wife. And so the sin in in this, it just spreads. And that's always what you'll find with sin. Every time you see sin in the Bible, you see it always affects others. Whether they wanted that or not, it just affects everybody. But God still sees the original couple as married regardless of their divorce on earth. You will find this teaching in Matthew, you will find it in Mark, and you will find it in Luke. However, let me point out some things here. There is something in Matthew's gospel that Mark doesn't mention. There is something in Mark's gospel that Matthew doesn't mention. Mark's gospel was written to Christians in Rome. You need to know this background information. Roman law permitted a woman to divorce her husband. So that phrase is in Mark. But you won't find that in Matthew. The phrase, don't let the woman divorce her husband, is only in Mark because that was only there permitted in Rome. So Mark would obviously include that if he's writing to Christians in Rome. Matthew is writing to a completely different audience. Matthew's gospel is written to a Jewish audience. And in traditional Jewish Palestine, a woman could not divorce her husband. So you will not find that phrase in Matthew's gospel. However, though, Matthew does involve an exception But before we go there, I want you to understand the command to stay married is to both. The command to the husband is not to leave. He's to stay married to his wife. The command to the wife is to stay married and she's not to leave. That is the intent of it all. But Matthew does, however, include this exception that Jesus gives to divorce that is not in Mark. Let's go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 19. You will find the same scenario. Matthew is writing over the same event that we just read in Peter. And in Matthew 19, verse 1, it says this, Now it came to pass, when Jesus had finished these sayings, that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Same scenario, this is the same context and setting. And in verse 4 it says, He answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. Up to this point everything has stayed the same as Mark. They're not contradictory in any way. And in verse 7 it says, Then they said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? Verse 8, Jesus says, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced, commits adultery. And so here in Matthew's teaching, and nowhere in the Bible does it ever contradict each other. Scripture will always interpret Scripture. You can put them together, and, uh, and you can have the whole counsel of God on this subject. And here you find this exception. The exception is sexual immorality. That breaks the covenant. In the Old Testament, if adultery were to take place and sexual immorality occurred, the covenant was broken there on earth, and then it would be broken finally by stoning. By death, that was the penalty for this. So if this were to happen in the Old Testament, uh, both would be brought before uh, God's people and they would stone them. And so the act, the sexual act, broke it off. It was finalized by death. 
In fact, that's the same scenario when you see uh, some of the Pharisees dragging some woman who was caught in adultery and puts her before Jesus, which I'm going to come back to that at the very end so you'll know kind of when we're getting done. But um, you, will, uh, you will find, though, that that, that that is the teaching. However, in the New Testament, Jesus allows for a divorce in this case, and that finalizes the break. So the adulterous act, that breaks the covenant, and it was finalized by Jesus in the New Testament. You don't have to stone her anymore. Grace was offered, and, uh, and a certificate of a divorce could be given, and that is seen as a break and final break of the covenant. Um, however, let me just say this on that. Even in those cases, marriages can still be reconciled. But if they can't because of these reasons, then there is a biblical exception for divorce. There is another biblical exception uh, for divorce and remarriage, and this is when death occurs. And this is a natural break. This isn't a forced break. This is actually a natural break. And you will find this in Romans chapter 7, 2 through 3. Paul teaches on this. He actually is using this illustration about the law, how the law brings Death, but we get life in Christ. But he points to the marriage as his illustration. In verse 2 of chapter 7 of Romans, it says, For the woman who has a husband who is bound by the law to her husband, or for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. You will find that teaching all over. That's the same thing Jesus said. That's the same thing Paul said in Corinth. He's saying the same thing in Romans. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. So you have sexual immorality that will free somebody and release them. You also have another exception, which is death, a more natural break. And that, and that death, uh, the covenant is not held to. That person is released and uh, they're free uh, to remarry if God so chooses to put that back in their life. But there's still one more. Uh, there's, a, there's a third and final one, and we'll get to that one in a moment. But let's look at Paul's teaching on divorce. So in light of all that we've kind of looked at so far, let's go back in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, there's a lot of teaching on this, but uh, I think this is important we get this right. But 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11 You will see Paul's teaching on divorce. But I want you to notice something in verse 11. Verse 11 is sandwiched between two commands. The command before it, you will find in verse 10, a wife is not to depart from her husband. 11, you got the meat of the sandwich. And at the last sentence, it says, and a husband is not to divorce her wife. So this teaching on divorce is sandwiched right in between this command to stay married. And so in verse 11, it says this, but even if she does depart... Let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. So that's the command from Jesus that is intended to be obeyed. But if someone chooses to disobey this command, there's two options. First option, if they choose to disobey the command from the Lord, the first option is you remain unmarried. And this is written in such a way that it's in the present tense and it's a command. Present tense means that's perpetual action. You remain unmarried constantly. That's one option. And that's a command. Option, well, before I go to option two, number one, that option, number one, it prevents you from committing adultery, right? God still sees them as married. So if you're going to leave, you're a believer, and you're you're two believers. One of them walks away. Option one is you have to continue to stay unmarried so that you don't commit adultery and so that no one else you marry commits adultery. That's option one. Option two, be reconciled to your husband. Be reconciled back. And so that is also written as a command. And I will just tell you, both line up with what Jesus taught on marriage and divorce. What Paul is speaking here in 1 Corinthians 7, no way contradicts what Jesus said. It doesn't contradict anything in the Old Testament. Any of those things, he says, to the married, I command, not I, but the Lord. This is the Lord's command on this subject. We also have a passage in the Old Testament where I'll just show you that you will find God's heart, I think, all in it, on God's heart on marriage and divorce. You want to know what God thinks about marriage, godly marriage, and divorce that is found in Malachi 2, 13. And that says, and this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, so he does not regard the offering anymore. 
nor receive it with good will from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? The picture is, they're up there crying, they don't understand, well, heaven's silent, God's not answering my prayers, I'm going through all this stuff, and uh, the, the word back to them is, uh, look, God's not receiving your prayers, he's not doing anything here. And then the response is, well, why is not God doesn't hear me? And here's the answer. Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Let me just point out this word, covenant. I've used it already, but I'm, that's a biblical term. The marriage is a covenant. I know most people today, they would see that as a contract. And a contract is different from a covenant because a contract's an agreement. You've signed contracts before. If you've ever bought a house, if you've ever bought a cell phone or insurance or any, any of those things, you've got contracts. And the contract is, I keep my end of the deal as long as you keep up your end of the deal. And vice versa. Covenants don't work that way. And I want you to see if you're married today that you need to look at your marriage as not a contract. I want you to today see your marriage. You're married today, see your marriage. It's a covenant. That is not a contract. That means you go 100% and more in whether the other person does or does not do it. Does that make sense? That is what God's viewpoint, I'm telling you, that's God's heart on marriage. And now in verse 15 he says, But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? Here's the answer. He seeks godly offspring. He seeks godly children to be raised in the home, that they be raised in fear and admonition of the Lord. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. For it covers one's garments with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. So there is a picture, and you will find this, God cares a great deal about marriage. And divorce is never good in his sight. Even there's biblical exceptions, but I'm just telling you, there, God's heart is, is that the two would stay married for a lifetime. That is his intention for creating it. And he created it, why? So it would bring glory and honor to him. I tell you, divorces rarely do that. But even in a mess, God can do something amazing out of it and still bring glory uh, to himself. But there is God's heart on marriage and divorce. God, the marriages should produce godly children. God that hates divorce, no matter how the covenant breaks. Now, I love doing this, pulling stuff out of the pulpit. One day I'm going to pull something crazy out there and you're like, how did that happen? Anybody ever played this game? Monopoly, you played this before? If you have not played this game, this game, if you were to start it today, would not end for 40 days and 40 nights. But this game, uh, it can get vicious. <laughs> uh, you ever played with a bulldog in this game? I would be afraid to play Anita Miller in this game, I think, out of all people, because she would just take all the money. Uh, but uh, people put houses on it, stuff, but you don't want to land on it anyway. You know the game. What's the one space you do not want to land on in this game? What was that? Someone said it right there. You don't want to land on the jail space. I thought somebody would say boardwalk or something like that. Because that's where no one wants to go. But you don't want to go to the jail space. What does the jail space do? It binds you down. And you can't get out. And everybody else is playing the game but you. And if they land on one of your stuff, you can't get paid because you're in jail. Right? Unless you have this card. That says this, it's chance. This card may be kept until needed or sold. Get out of jail free. Let me tell you how people sometimes view their marriages. They feel like they've landed on the jail space. And that they're bound and cannot get out. And so my fear is, is when I preach sermons like this or I go to give biblical exceptions, someone's going to go, I just got my get out of jail free card. I'm telling you. There are biblical exceptions, but in no way should you look at your marriage as a way out. You have that card, I want you to just rip it up. Rip that up, whatever the biblical exception is, take that card, put it up, and just commit your marriage into God's hands. And, and I know you're seeing, maybe, your marriage, I'm bound, everybody else is out there playing the game and having fun with life, and I'm bound and I'm trapped in this I'm telling you, God's intention was never meant for you to be 
just looked at as a ball and chain. Right? That's some, the old ball and chain. I'm strapped down. God's covenant that he created marriage for, it was meant to be a blessing. That was meant for you to have godly children. It was meant to be a blessing. The adultery, getting out of that, uh, breaking the covenant in that way, I mean, God's not trying to keep you from having fun. He's trying to bless the marriage. He's given you something wonderful that you could embrace. Let me give you some application. Your marriage is not a jail space. Being bound in a covenant, it's meant to be a lifelong blessing. Pray with and for your spouse. Spend time together. Talk to each other. Worship together. Y'all have heard the saying, y'all started, y'all finished, a family that prays together. All right, so y'all have heard that. I'm telling you, worship, come to church, serve together, serve the, go all in with Jesus together. A cord of three strands, it says it's not uneasy to ravel. Especially if one of those strands is Jesus Christ. Wrap your marriage around Jesus Christ. Do not see it as this jail space and just looking for a way out of it. God, please give me this. Let me use this card. Look, would you just, if I could save a marriage today, if it's on the rock, whatever, how bad it is, put that up. And just give it to God. I don't know what God will or will not do, but make the decision in your heart. I, I, I'm going to try to make this work. Whatever God would ask me to do, I'm going to try to do that. Now you may say, what if my spouse is not a believer? I want to go to worship together. I'd like to pray together. I'd like to fast and go all in on the Lord. But my spouse isn't a believer. What do I do? Well, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Because that is the very next thing Paul talks about. Now, I want you to notice as we're going to look in this next section of chapter 7 and verse 12, Paul is going to switch gears and now he's going to sw- talk to a completely different audience. The first audience, married believers, equally yoked category. Now, in verse 12, if you say, look, my spouse is not a believer, what do I do? Well, the Corinthians there at Corinth wrote on this same issue to Paul. Do I get a divorce? What do I do, Paul? What do I do? And uh, he answers this in verse 12. It says this, But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say. Now before we go any further, right there, that will cause some hiccups. Will someone say, what, what, what is Paul doing? Paul's going to do something that God's not going to agree with? Look, let me uh, just share with you a little story. I, saw I was in a seminary class, and uh, one of the guys, we, we were in a theology course, and one of the students next to me or in the back or something, asked the professor and brought up this passage. And he says, well, what's going on with this? You're saying the Bible is inspired, but is this still inspired? Paul says, I command this, but no, the Lord don't command it. And the professor's response was, well, Paul was writing his opinion, but God agreed with it, so it made it in the Bible. I almost coughed out loud on myself. Just, look, eh, that's wrong. That dude was wrong. And you'll be surprised to know that I, I didn't. I held my tongue. <laughs> I didn't even say anything. I jacked with them another time. But I, th- that is not, look, that is not the case here. Paul has just quoted from Jesus, did he not? We just read a passage to the married that completely dealt with everything Jesus taught. So he says, I didn't command this. The Lord's already commanded it. What Paul is doing here, I'm about to teach on a subject that Jesus Christ himself has not taught on. And you will not find it in the Gospels. Jesus did not deal with this subject. So Paul's saying to the rest, look, this is from me. Jesus didn't teach on this. But Paul is still writing on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. All of the Bible is inspired. All of chapter 7 is inspired. All of this that we're about to read in verses 12 through 16 is inspired by God. Jesus did not run into this issue on, uh, while in his earthly ministry. But Paul did. And here is maybe why. Uh, after Jesus ascended into heaven. He commanded the apostles to do what? Get out of Jerusalem. Go. Take the gospel to the ends of the earth. As they were doing that, of course, there were heathen cities. You would have Rome and Corinth and all these others that they're taking the gospel into, and people would start getting saved. Most first-generation Christians were getting saved after they were already married. Sometimes in the Bible, you see a whole household come to know the Lord. And that's awesome. Philippians, uh, you'll, you'll see that the background of that in Acts chapter 16. The Philippian jailer, we see a whole household come. But that didn't always happen. Sometimes just one got saved. Even if they heard the same message, the same gospel being preached, one of the spouse got saved and the other one 
maybe remained in their temple pagan worship. But you had one that's fighting against that and wanting to worship Jesus. This new religion that's spreading around. And, uh, man, they give their heart and life to Christ and they're trying to follow that. So this is what Paul is dealing with. The situation at hand that we're dealing with now is between a married believer that is married to an, uh, a non-believer. So you have a believer married to a non-believer situation, and that is what we're looking at. So that's what means to the rest. So to the unequally yoked in the room, you would pay attention. And if you are, you know you are. I've been there. I, I, I know. Uh, you, you just know. So they're asking, Paul, what do we do now? What do we do now? Do we divorce? What do we do? But Paul's counsel starts in verse 12. He says this, If any brother has a wife who does not believe, and she is willing to live with him, Let him not divorce her. Verse 13, and a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. What Paul is saying is it's still stay married. Here it's stay married if at all possible. If they're willing, you still stay married. Now we've read a lot of passages on marriage and divorce. You see why the goal would still be to try. can, Can you see that from the Bible? We've looked at all that. Yeah, help me out a little bit. Okay, we can see that. Uh, so his counsel is you stay married if at all possible. But notice the commands are still not to get a divorce, but to stay married if the unbeliever is willing to live with you. And so, again, this situation, again, is not used to be, here's my get-out-of-jail-free card. So if you got this in your back pocket as you're listening to what I'm telling you, just put that, put that away for a moment. Paul counsels to stay married for two reasons, and the next verses are going to explain that. The first reason uh, is found in verse 14. Here's the first reason why you stay married to an unbeliever. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Now again, this right here causes some eyebrows to be raised. What do you mean? I thought the Bible teaches only one person can get saved and they get saved by their own faith. Your faith don't save anybody else. Yes, that is all true. He is this, as he's saying this, they're sanctified by, he's not talking about salvation. Uh, only Jesus can do that. We know that. But not only that, we have the proof at the very end of this in verse 16. Verse 16 is the proof. Sometimes if you can't understand a passage, you zoom out and you look at the context and you go back in. We zoom out in verse 16. He says, for how do you know, a wife, whether you will save your husband? How do you know, a husband, whether you'll save your wife? That verse alone right there tells them that they are lost. Okay? And so when we go back into the passage and in verse uh, 14, we can see that this word sanctified doesn't mean that. So if it doesn't mean that they're going to get saved because of, uh, that you're going to save them, what does it mean? It means that, and let me give you some options here. Uh, the unbeliever is not being contaminated by a heathen lifestyle if they're living to, if they're willing to live with you and put up with your Christian morals and values. If they're willing to stay with you, they're willing to put up with the way you live as a Christian, you have gospel influence over them. And if they're willing to do that, then your marriage can still be set apart. God's blessing can still be on the home. God can still bless you and it still affect them. Does that make sense? And that happens all the time when God blesses somebody, especially if someone, an employee at their work. It's not the whole company getting blessed if God decides to bless one of the employees. This is the same thing. There's influence here. The unbelieving spouse is brought under the saving influence of the Holy Spirit displayed through the believer. In fact, Peter says this same thing in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. It says this, wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word. What's Peter talking about? Unequally yoked, is he not? Even if your husband doesn't believe, if he's not a believer, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. That cannot happen if you don't stay together. Make sense? He's saying if they're willing to live with you, Let them stay. You stay married. You can have gospel influence all over them. You pray for them. You pray for their salvation. And the Holy Spirit can do all kinds of things through your life without even you saying anything. I had a little joke, but this is going to be hard for for the women to do. I'm telling you, there's a proverb that says it'd be better to sleep on the corner of a roof than to live with a nagging wife. I didn't say it. The Bible did. 
What I'm telling you is this. The temptation is going to be to hound them and hound them and hound them and hound them. What Peter is saying is, look, you could win them without even saying a word. Now, I'm all for verbal evangel- uh, evangelism. I do not believe in the lifestyle evangelism, but here in this context, Peter is saying, look, wives, you can have the most influence if you will just submit to them, do the role of a godly wife. You pray for them, and you live out your faith before their eyes, and I tell you, the Holy Spirit can do more through you than you could do with 10,000 words. Does that make sense? So stay with them and pray for them. That's what he's saying here. Not only that, here's the second reason. That's reason number one. That's a good reason, would you say? That would be a good reason to stay married to a lost person. Second reason to stay married to a lost person is found at the end of verse 14. He says, otherwise your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. Okay, so we've already dealt with this is not salvation. So the children aren't automatically saved. You don't start baptizing infants because of this passage. Uh, You don't do that. The words unclean and sanctify, they are speaking to the same thing, though. Gospel influence. You can still have influence over your children. Also, this may answer one of the questions. We don't have the questions that the Corinthians wrote to Paul. All we have is Paul's response back. So that's one, another thing that makes this kind of hard. But if this was a question, am I or my children in sin if I stay married to my unbelieving spouse? Paul would say, No, you're not in sin, and your children aren't contaminated. In fact, you have gospel influence over that lost person, and you still have gospel influence over your children. That's what he's saying. In Roman society, the children typically went to live with the father. That doesn't happen today. But in that society, uh, that, that happened, right? The children usually stay with the mom. But in this society, the children would go and stay with the father. Now, if that were the case for a Christian wife, could you imagine what that would be like? If you're a Christian wife and you got a, a divorce with, an, uh, with your spouse who's an unbeliever and they're going to be going to the pagan temple worship, not only that, but they're taking your children along with them. When you not say this is another good reason to stay married to a lost person, you still have gospel influence over your household. If at all possible, if they're willing to live with you, stay married. Do not take this get-out-of-jail-free card because you will wreak havoc on yourself and your heart as you watch your children get pulled in a different direction. If you got them in your house with you, use it and pour out God's love and influence all over them while you can. If you split up, you got kids now going to be with an unbeliever for a little bit, and kids are going to be with a believer for a little bit, and torn in two different directions. Don't do it. Stay married. Would you not say those are two good reasons to stay married to a lost person? I think those are two very good reasons. All right, so what if they do depart? So if they do leave, that unbeliever leaves, what do I do? Well, look in verse 15. If the unbeliever departs, let him depart. It says to let them go. And I'll tell you, this is a command. Let them depart. All the commands up to this point have been do not divorce. Do not depart, do not divorce. If you do, the next command was to stay unmarried. The other command was to come back. This command says let them go. You let them depart. This command says, if they leave, do not stop them. However, notice the text says, if they leave. If they leave, you make the commitment that it's not going to be you. If you're a believer, you make the commitment, it ain't going to be me. If they leave, if they cannot put up with the Christian life I'm living and the commitment I'm going to have, the Bible says, let them depart. But I would also just tell you this is still all under the umbrella of staying married if at all possible. All right, so what does it mean if I leave, if they leave and I let them go? Notice it says you are released. Verse 15, but if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister, that's a believer, right, is not under bondage in such cases. So a couple phrases, let me point out a couple phrases for you. Not under bondage. What does that mean? Not under bondage is the illusion he's been talking to throughout the Bible of what it means to be bound by law and covenant. A marriage covenant. In a marriage covenant, you are bound by law to that person. What Paul is saying here is if someone departs and you let them go, what that means for you is released. Does that make sense? You are not under bondage in such cases. In such cases is the second phrase. So the second phrase means this qualifies as the third and final exemption for divorce. So you have three biblical exemptions on divorce. 
One, you have sexual immorality. Two, you have death. Three, you have it in the case of a believer and non-believer. But again, i got to pull this out because someone in here is going to say, there it is, I got my exception. I didn't say that. If you do that and you... I, you know, you, you go out on your own if that's what you're just looking for a way out. You commit to honoring your covenant that you're in, and you leave the rest up to God. You, you don't know if they're going to stay or leave. In fact, that's how he ends with in verse 16. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? You don't know. You don't know. If the, and I don't think he's trying to be pessimistic here. I think he's saying that's a real reality. If you're going to try to fight to keep them there, you have no idea if that will end up saving them or not. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it husband, sometimes it doesn't. But why, why, why do I not put up the fight? You'll find that in verse, end of verse 15. God has called us to peace. You don't have to go fight in a courtroom. You don't have to go out there, put up a fight in court or elsewhere. If they've made their decision in pursuing it, God's called us to peace. He says to let, let go. And you just leave the rest up to the Lord. This is an appropriate time for me to share my testimony. Some of you may know it. Some of you may not. But if you're in this case, I've been in this case. And so I will share my, I've shared it with the pastor search committee. I've shared it because other people, uh, you know, this would not fly in some churches about divorce. Could you serve as a deacon? Could you serve as an ordained minister? Um, you got to find what God's whole counsel is on the subject. Are you still married or are you released is the question. That's how you, be, that's how you can be determined if you're a one-woman man uh, or not in those qualifications in 1 Timothy. I came to the Lord. When I came to the Lord, I was married. My life was a wreck. I was a heathen. Uh, I was a bum, a drunk, whatever you want to call me. I would have accepted. I, I, was, I was messed up, badly messed up. In fact, I'd already been married once. And I'd gotten married again. My life was in shambles, I assure you. And uh, through circumstances, God started getting my attention. And through those circumstances, I, I just found myself with the desire to go to church. And I, and I still can't, exp- I was talking to Brittany about this on Saturday. I still don't know what made me go to church that day. I woke up and it felt like something was tugging me. That's all I know. I woke up and something was drawing me there. My parents had went to a church at First Baptist Forney. And so uh, I woke up. Uh, I was married. And I said, I'm going to go to church today. And, of course, I got that look like, you want to go to church? <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm getting the boys I'm, and I'm going. I, I, got, I got my boys ready, and, and we were going to head out. You know, she wasn't going to go. Uh, Last-minute decision. She said, okay, fine, I'll go too. Anyway, so there we, it wasn't the most pleasant ride to church that day. We, we, we go, didn't know where the kids were supposed to go or not, uh, got some help, and I, we get in the service, sit towards the back, and music was already playing, and uh, I didn't even recognize the songs, which was convicting for me. I, I, uh, they weren't singing, I could sing of your love forever, and uh, what, whatever else I could remember from from the 90s songs in my youth. Music had changed. Sounded like it changed for the better, but I didn't know anything. And so I was like, man, I hadn't been here in a long time. I don't recognize any of this stuff. And then the pastor starts preaching. And he opens up in sermon, and he, he turns into Luke. And he preaches a message entitled One of Ten, about ten lepers who were cleansed, but only one turns back. And uh, throughout that sermon, I stopped hearing vo- his voice and started hearing God's voice. And God was, I could just feel him speaking to me and calling me. And I was getting convicted. I couldn't even breathe. In fact, I wanted to go down to the front. But she was like, look, you've made enough scene back here. Don't do that. I was coming apart at the seams. Everybody else sitting around us. I couldn't control it. I had so much guilt built up in my life. And I was just breaking down. And I just finally said, Lord, take it. Now, she had heard the same sermon I did, but it did something different to me. And I walked out of there forgiven, free saved. I had no idea what any of those things meant at that time. All I know is I walked out and just thought, something just happened to me. And I had a desire to go back. I had a, it was, to me, it was a complete 180 for me. I did not want to go to the bar. I did not want to go to the concerts we were going to. Uh, all those things. And all of that caused incredible friction. 
She was going, wanting to go in the direction we were going. I was wanting to, to, to go a new direction. I wanted to go to church every time the doors opened. Uh, I had a heart for God's word. I had a heart to pray. I was giving away our money to the church. That didn't go over well either. Um, I mean, all kinds of stuff. There was friction. In fact, at one point, I went and changed all our radio stations to Christian channels. Uh, this, it, it was a nightmare. And I'm not saying I did everything right I, I'm not, or any of those things. I, I was zealous for the Lord, and I didn't know how to work that out. Uh, but I was probably a pain in the rear. Um, it's a noose around your neck if you're trying to live with a believer and you want to do something else. She'd call up and say, hey, a bunch of our friends are trying to go, want to go to this concert. And I'd just be like, man, I just I don't have that desire anymore. I mean, I, I don't want to go. And I knew why we showed up to concerts early, and I knew we, why we stayed late, and why you had designated drivers for those things. I mean, I just didn't want to do it. And my, my desires had changed. Uh, and I was debating on saying this or not, but I'll just put it out there in the universe. Uh, it gets so bad that even her whole mouth began breaking out into ulcers, all the stress it was causing. So much so that her mom comes to me and said, what's going on? I'm like, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the deal is, but, but it, was, it, was, it was bad, real bad. And um, so she got some family influence, I think, said, look, you just, you just need to get out of this. I had no idea this scenario was even in the Bible. But there I received my command if they're going to go, you let them go. And I didn't stand in the way. And after that, uh, she remarried pretty quickly. What I began to do is I began to serve the Lord, and I felt free to do that. And this is pretty rare. Typically, we wouldn't try to do this, but in six months, I was teaching a Sunday school class. I mean, I was just growing by leaps and bounds. I was being discipled at a thirst for God's word. And, uh, and I began living by the principles in 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 9. That it's good to not be married, not just be single. And that's what I did. Until another woman came into my life four years later. <laughs> in fact, when she came into the Sunday school class, she, she was asking some of the other girls about my testimony. She said, I don't know, he's never shared it. He's only shared parts of it. The you know, reason why I don't share this is because I'm embarrassed by it. I don't tell you this so you can look at me. I'm embarrassed, okay? I'm not proud of any of those things. I don't like that those things have happened. I prayed for that marriage. I did everything I could. I have a clean conscience before God that I did everything I could for that marriage to stay intact. Prayed more than you could imagine. Didn't eat. I didn't even know I was fasting, and I was. Did everything I could. And the only reason I have courage to tell you that today is because of Brittany coming into my life, and she says, you need to share it. And so I thank Brittany today for even giving me the courage to share that testimony, because without her, I never shared this. I'd found a way to share my testimony and, without le- and leave the embarrassing parts out of it. But I tell you all this today so that you don't say, okay, I'll get my get-out-of-jail-free card and I'll go. Because what will happen is someone will come to me and say, look, Art, you've been through divorce, you can approve mine. I'm not going to. I, I see what the Bible says on marriage. It's elevated. I see what the Bible says on divorce, and that, that is... It's not good any way you cut it. People are traumatized. Kids are hurt by it. It's a bad deal. I don't know what your situation is like today, but if I could save one marriage in here today, I would invite you to just renew your marriage vows. You would make a choice in your life today that divorce is not an option. As we prepare for this last song, let me walk us through some things. To the married in the room, if you're married, Stay married and renew that commitment. Fight for your marriage and your covenant. It's worth fighting for. And Brittany, I thank you for giving me the courage to say this. To those who have dealt treacherously in their marriage, and you know this if it's been you, I would tell you there's forgiveness for you. You can be forgiven today. Divorce is not the unpardonable sin. That's been looked at in Baptist life. It's been looked at in history. But divorce is not the unpardonable sin. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit is the unpardonable sin, which is only something a lost person can do. If you've messed up in this area, there's forgiveness. Let me remind you of the woman at the well. How many husbands does she have? That woman had five husbands. You know what Jesus said to her? I offer you living water. I don't care what your past is. He offers that to you today. Let me remind you of the woman caught in adultery. Remember those Pharisees that brought her up? They were getting ready to stone this woman. Jesus starts drying, riding on the ground. Nah, nah, boo-boo. 
They walk off. He says, where are your, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. He said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. You remember Rahab the prostitute in the Old Testament? Prostitute by profession. Forgiven, saved, and welcomed into Israel, God's people. Not only that, you will find Rahab in the line of Jesus in Matthew 1. I'm telling you, God can turn a real mess if you'll give it to him into an incredible masterpiece. And it'll be awesome. To the rest, the unequally yoked in the room, you know if I'm speaking to you. Commit to praying for your unbelieving spouse. Pray for him. Hold off on the nagging if you can and just pray. Let your life be a witness. Commit to going all in on your covenant regardless if they do or do not. Get on your face before God and ask for their salvation. And commit to doing whatever your role is. Find your biblical role. If it's your if it's a man, you're married to an unbelieving wife, you love her sacrificially. That's your role. Woman, if you're married to the man and he's not a believer... You fulfilling your role may win him to Christ. Godly submission, not being a doormat, but submitting to leadership in the home. You praying for them. I'm just telling you, you live the gospel out in front of them. You never know what God will do. But if you were faced with a decision over marriage or divorce, if someone was in here with those two options, my plea to you is would you choose your marriage? Would you put up the get out of jail free card and choose your marriage and leave whatever God, the rest happens into God's hands. I pray that you would do that. Would you stand with me as we sing this last song? I would ask that you would bow your heads and hearts with me. Open up your soul before the Lord right now. God's speaking to you today. God's spirit spoke through his word. You heard his voice. Convicted over sin. And you need help dealing with that need to give your life to Jesus Christ you can do that today you admit that what God has told you is true, that you're a sinner that you believe in the truths about Jesus and you commit to a life obeying Jesus as Lord and if that's the decision you want to make today I invite you is when we begin singing that you would simply come forward and talk to one of us it would be our delight to counsel with you Maybe you just want to come before these steps and pray and ask God for forgiveness. Just saying, I've messed up in this area. Will you forgive me? I'm telling you, God's forgiveness awaits you. It awaits you. There is forgiveness anytime a repentant heart turns to Jesus Christ. Maybe today you would like to take you and your spouse and come forward and join a church. And I'm telling you, the doors are wide open for you. If you would like to join a biblical Bible preaching church, that is what we are committed to. Regardless of past, the doors are open for you and we extend an offer to you today. Our Heavenly Father, I ask God that today, in these next few moments, Lord, that you would move in a mighty, powerful way. God, I pray that you would begin convicting hearts. I pray marriages can be restored. I pray those who are feeling guilt and shame over this, that they would turn to you and find forgiveness. I pray if there's anyone lost in this room right now, they'd cry out to Jesus Christ for the first time and receive mercy and grace. God, we give you these next few moments and ask that you would move. And we give you the praise and honor forever. For you alone are worthy. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.